Okay, guys, so welcome to our last lecture on uh, the human condition, CVSP 205. And we're going to wrap things up with Abu Hamid Al Ghazali as our uh, season finale, so to speak. Before doing so, we'll take a step back and kind of recall what we've been discussing so far. So we've been kind of talking about the ways in which we experience what it means to be human, right? The fact that we are thrown into the world and that we ask certain questions about our existence, where from, where to, and we talked about the importance of experience, the importance and the givenness of experience, and uh, uh, our, for example, St. Augustine's attempt to resolve certain problems and his pursuit of a method to solve those problems. And that was primarily the problem of evil and God. And that in order for him to resolve these problems, he adopted the platonic method, which accounted for both the material and the immaterial. Now, the Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, we find a very similar uh, case, a very similar story. Uh, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali's pursuit in particular is a pursuit of certainty certain knowledge right so let's first begin with a short biography of who was this man in order to kind of understand the importance of uh his journey so i mean this is on the fly sheet so you can read it but basically abu hamid al-ghazali was not just a amateur abu hamid al-ghazali was one of the preeminent scholars of Islam at the time, right? At the time, he even occupied the chair of law uh, in Fuqh, um, in Baghdad, in the Madrasa in Baghdad. And in 1095, he experienced a sort of spiritual crisis. Now we will see what the spiritual crisis was about, but it was really no, not very different than crisis of uh, St. Augustine and others. It is a crisis that emanates from us being human and us per trying to pursue certain questions and to answer those questions with certainty. So Ghazali says in al munqid my inmost being, right, my desire was to discover what this to discover what this original nature really was and what the beliefs derived from the authority of my parents and teachers really were. In other words, he wanted to distinguish between the way things really are, the reality of the world, the reality of objects, the reality of man on one hand, and the teachings and the uh, uh, information that had been given to him by authorities, such as his parents, right? So uh, uh, is, are, are, are the beliefs that we inherited valid? And if so, why? And for Ghazali and for, for Islam, generally speaking, this is important. Why? Because faith, right? Faith in our beliefs is not based on skepticism or uh, tradition, but rather as the Ash'arites, who are a uh, who are the school of the theological school that Ghazali belonged to, uh, uh, iman faith essentially means a tasdiq that is based on al ilm, and it excludes al taqlid. So, what is it tasdiq? Tasdiq means conviction. It means to be convinced on the basis of al ilm and what is al ilm knowledge meaning information or ideas that conform to reality so if i were to say that this is a pepsi bottle that would not be ilm because it does not conform to the reality of what it is a water bottle and most importantly that iman must exclude a taqlid a taqlid means to adopt beliefs uh, on the basis of authority without investigating the reasons and without evidence. 
So this was pretty much a existential issue for Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, right? If Iman is based on conviction and my teachers have told me one thing, then how do I know that my beliefs are true? How do I go about uh, reaching a tasdiq and conviction? And what is alim? What does it mean for something to conform to reality, right? What does evidence mean? Now, he sets up the, he kind of sets up the scenario for us. He says, okay, look, to begin with, what I am looking for is knowledge of what things really are, right? The essence of things. So I must undoubtedly try to find it. I must undoubtedly try to find what knowledge really is, right? And it was plain to me that knowledge is yaqeen. So in other words, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali is asking a very deep question here. He's saying, not only must I ask what is the nature of this water bottle, the nature of things, right? Obtain knowledge about it, certain knowledge about it. But I have to take a step back and ask, take a step back and ask, well, what is knowledge to begin with? What is knowledge? What is the meaning of knowledge? And for Ghazali, he says, okay, if knowledge is that on which I base my beliefs and my actions and my practices and my attitudes and so forth, well, then knowledge, al-ilm, cannot be anything but yaqeen. It has to be based on certainty, meaning that there is no possibility for error or for doubt. So what Ghazali is looking for in this text, al munqid is not necessary to understand the reality of man or the reality of a particular object, but he wants to understand what is the source of certain knowledge, right? What is knowledge? This is the question of epistemology. So he goes from the question of knowledge of things such as this pen or man to the question of knowledge itself what is it alim what does it mean to know and how do we know what we know and then how do we reach and ascertain certain knowledge yaqeen now this brings us to a discussion about epistemology what is epistemology epistemology is the study uh, of the nature, the origins, and the limits of human knowledge. It looks into two things. It looks into the nature of the human mind and the relationship between the human mind and the external world, right? So the human mind, what are its limits? And then what is the relationship between my mind and the external world, right? Because what I want to know are realities and things about the external world and clearly there is a gap between me for example and this water bottle so epistemology deals with two things Abu Hamid al-Ghazali is going to investigate two things first the nature of the human mind and second the relationship between the mind and uh, the world right the way in which the external world appears to us now does it appear to us in a deceptive way? Does it appear to us in a fragmented way? Does it appear to us in an illusionary way? Does it appear to us in a clear way as it is? This is what we want to try to find out. So again, he's trying to pursue certain knowledge. Why certain knowledge? Certain knowledge, he says, must be infallible, meaning that it cannot allow for error and that it cannot be falsified so for example he gives this example he says i know that 10 is more than three okay now you don't need evidence to know more than to know that 10 is more than three but what if someone says to ghazali no three is more than 10 and in proof of that, I shall change this rod into a serpent. 
And let us suppose that he actually changes the rod into a serpent and that I witness him doing so. So now here we have a problem. We have a contradiction between our senses and between our certain knowledge. Okay, because we know with certainty prior to experience that certain truths are infallible, such as 10 is more than 3 and 3 is less than 10. But what if somebody comes and attempts to deceive our senses? Then what do we do? So what we have to do now is to explore the relationship between the mind and our senses. Can we rely on our senses? So here Ghazali says, okay, well, this brings me to a problem. Is my reliance on sense perception and my trust in the soundness of necessary truths of the same kind as my previous trust in the beliefs that I had merely taken from others? In other words, given that now there is a gap between the knowledge that we, there's a contradiction between the knowledge that we attained from our senses and what we held to be necessary truths. They are now in contradiction, right? Because of this hypothetical situation. Could it not also be the case that these necessary truths and the beliefs that my scholars and my teachers have given me are also false, are also unreliable, right? So this is what sends him into a state of skepticism. What is the relationship between the sense perceptions and certain truths? If I cannot rely on my sense perceptions because they may deceive me, can I rely on necessary truths? Are they certain? Are they the proper grounds for knowledge? And again, certain truth, necessary truth means truths that do not require experience, whereas uh, sensory Knowledge is knowledge that is based on touch, smell, hearing, eyesight, and taste. Now, why are these sensory perceptions and knowledge obtained from senses uh, deceitful or unreliable? Because one, they can be hallucinations, right? Uh, they can be drug-induced hallucinations, or they can be illusions misrepresentations of stimuli of the external objects. Illusions keep, let's say you put on red lenses and everything appears to be red and you don't know that you're wearing red lenses, right? These are illusions. And so the sensory perceptions cannot be trusted for precisely those two reasons. They can either be based on hallucinations or they can be based on illusions. Now, here he says, okay, given that I cannot rely on my sensory perceptions, perhaps what I can do is try to base my knowledge on foundational truths. And he says foundational truths perhaps are perhaps only those intellectual truths which are first principles. Um, or derived from first principles are to, or those are the only truths uh, that are to be relied upon, uh, such as the assertion that 10 is more than three and that three is less than 10, right? Uh, and why is this a necessary truth? Uh, because we do not require experience or other, there are other foundational truths, for example, that something cannot exist and not exist at the same time. So here, Ghazali seems to arrive at a sort of preliminary resolution. He says, okay, look, look, look. I can't rely on my senses, clearly, right? So let me investigate what we call these foundational truths. Foundational truths are what we call a priori truths. And, and, and for Ghazali, Ghazali al-ilm al meaning that it is not knowledge that I have to experience 
or that I have to infer. I do not have to ask a scholar for it. For example, I do not have to ask العلم المكتسب, علم that requires experience, would be something such as what is the color of uh, Abdullah's car, right? Or um, what is the chemical composition of H2O? This is علم المكتسب. This is knowledge that requires experience. It is not certain. So for Ghazali says, okay, what I will do is I will begin with the foundational truth, the first principles. No two things can coexist at the same time, right? You cannot have uh, two contradictions coexisting, for example. Uh, 10 is greater than three and so forth. So for him, he says, okay, let's start off with this. This is certain knowledge. Now, this brings us into a debate that is quite common in epistemology, which is called what is skeptic epistemology, right? And skeptic epistemology uh, is, has two different opinions, two different trends, okay? There are those who believe in rationalism, al-aqliya, and they believe that, look, we are born with certain innate ideas, certain fundamental truths, right? For example, all triangles have three sides or two plus two equal to four. These are rational truths. You do not need the scientific method to demonstrate them. You do not need sensory perceptions. And there's another school which says that, no, there are no innate ideas. Rather, there are only sense perceptions. For example, the statement, I am wearing shoes, we must look at our feet to determine whether this is true. There is a table in the room, well, we must look around to see if this is true. Now, this is where things get interesting. He says, okay, I know that there's different types of knowledge, clearly. There's knowledge I get from my senses and knowledge that is innate, certain. So we can cancel out sensory perceptions. Why is this blue? I don't know, let's use red. We can cancel out sensory perceptions. We are left with foundational truths. So then he says something, he says something very interesting. He says, what if these foundational truths, okay, which we said one plus one equal to two, 10 is greater than three, a triangle has three sides. What if there is something that is superior to that, right? Something that is even greater than those truths, right? And so he says, perhaps behind the intellectual apprehension, i.e. the foundational truths, there is yet another judge who, if he manifests himself, will show the falsity of the intellect in its judging. This might sound uh, complicated, but it is not. He says, what if, for example, this world in which I am going around saying one plus one equal to two, all triangles have three sides. What if this is all a dream, right? What if this is all illusion? How do I know that these realities exist? How do I know that I even exist? Now, if you guys remember this from the movie, let me see if I have it here. Uh, no, I don't want this. From the movie Matrix, right? What if, how do I remove this? Oh, clear all drawings. Yes. Okay. So this is kind of like the movie Matrix. What if this world in which we claim that there is certain knowledge is really just a big matrix, a computer? What if we're all just asleep and these, uh, these ideas, one plus one equal to two, three, Three, tri three sides of a triangle. What if these are all part of a dream, right? Uh, is that possible? Yes, it's certainly possible, right? That's what the movie The Matrix is about. And we know, right, for example, when we go to sleep, we see things very vividly and we think that they're real, 
and then we wake up and we realize that they were not right but in the dream we have certainty that they are real so i mean this is quite profound how I mean, Ghazali is going very, very deep. You can see how existentially torn he is, right? Um, and another way to think about this is in terms of, you know, to, just to give you an example of uh, 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 these, these annotated, one second. Probably should have learned how to use this before I started this, okay. What if um, we somebody came to falsify these uh, uh, foundational truths, such as you cannot have two contradictory things existing at once? Is that possible? Well, now we know from quantum physics, right, and and you know some of the latest uh, uh, mysteries emerging from. Uh, the discuss discoveries of the quantum scientists that there are times there are times in which there are hypothetical situations in which <coughs> something can exist and not exist at the same time certain quarks and so forth anyways the point is that what ghazali is discussing is not you know something that's purely hypothetical or or insane or absurd it is a legitimate concern so ghazali wants to make sure that there is nothing or whether or not there is something that is superior to those first truths, such as the computer that controls our mind, or perhaps something else, the matrix, uh, or, or, or something. So let's go back and discuss a bit about the limitations so first of all, we can rule out sensory perceptions. Why? Because uh, the, 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 the external, the mind, first of all, is, is limited, right? For example, um, these are internal limitations. There are certain colors that we cannot see. There are certain uh, sound waves that we cannot hear uh, and, and so forth. And then there are certain external obstacles, which is that sometimes, reality distorts itself. For example, when you put a pen in paper or when there's an, uh, in water or when there's an eclipse and so forth. So there is a, there is a, I don't, so there is a veil, right? A veil of perceptions. So then how do we overcome this? We come back to Ghazali's first question. I can rely on my foundational truths, but before I can do that, I have to answer the question. Is there something that is superior to all of these things? Is there something that can answer the, my question? What if I am asleep? What if this is all an illusion? Now, hint. Remember when we went back to the beginning of the course and we talked about the idea of experience, right? The idea of experience can experience be a way of obtaining certainty and more importantly as in the case with uh, uh, saint augustine and this was his problem with plato is there an intellect a sort of superior mind that is greater and more powerful than our minds, that makes these foundational truths possible to begin with, and that makes sure that these are not illusions. So here we reach precisely what St. Augustine reached, and we will see this is what Al-Ghazali will reach, and this is the idea and the fact that experience is a mode of knowledge. To recall, what is experience? If you were to come and tell me water, water can quench your thirst, water, experience of drinking water is refreshing and so forth, I'd be like, okay, cool, that's good. Now I have the data in my head. 
But then let's say I'm thirsty and I drink the water, I am experiencing it. That's different. So Ghazali says, and St. Augustine say, experience is a mode of knowledge. To experience something is the means through which you attain certainty. And how do you experience something through interiority, not exteriority, not by reaching out, but it must happen from within, right? You must allow yourself to experience certain phenomena. Now here, later Al-Ghazali, like Augustine, is talking about experiencing something particular, right? Not a water bottle, not man, but who? God, right? Can I experience God? I can have certain foundational proofs about God that everything which, must, everything which begins to exist must have a cause. God, uh, the universe began to exist, yada, yada, yada. Right? I, can, I can write down data about proof of the, that there's a God. I can say, oh, look at the design of the universe. This points to a God. But I want to experience God. So it's kind of like uh, uh, if you have a, let's say you had, you gave birth to a baby. As soon as the baby was uh, uh, delivered, you were blindfolded, the baby was taken away. And then the nurse comes and tells you, well, I can tell you everything you want to know about the baby. I can tell you its name. I can tell you its way. I can tell you its skin tone, etc. But what would, what, what, what would your response be? You'd be like, no, 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 no. I want to hold, I want to experience the baby, right? I want that proximity with the baby. So Ghazali, in the end, his pursuit of the knowledge, his pursuit of, of knowledge, his pursuit, uh, his questioning of what is truth, his question of what are sensory perceptions, what are foundation of truth, is there something that is superior, is experience a made of knowing, it is all a means towards an end, which is the same ends of Ghazali, and that is, I want to experience God. I don't want to know about God. I want to experience God. In the same way, I want to experience, for example, I don't want to know the ingredients of uh, this wonderful cake that you're going to make. I want to experience it. So what Ghazali calls it a dhok. He says there's a difference between knowing and tasting, right? And this, And I said that this you know, kind of culminates our whole course precisely because uh, in it we have the question of what is man? Man is that being with sensory perceptions. Man is that being who pursues foundational truths. And man is that being who experiences. Man is that being who faces an existential crisis. Man is that being who pursues the truth. But man is not only a being who pursues the truth, but also a being that wants to experience the truth, wants to experience what is ultimately real. And for Ghazali and St. Augustine, that is God. For Plato and the philosopher king, that is the ideal forms, the good, and so forth. Tayyib. Now, Ghazali in this journey, he says, okay, one second, somebody's at the door. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, anyways, so let's kind of summarize where we, where we are up until now, okay? Let's clear these annotations this is very unprofessional but uh this is if, if you were here if we were actually together in class it would have been a discussion anyway so let's keep it real heart to heart okay clear all drawings yellow so we see that ghazali is this young Muslim scholar he wants to pursue. Ghazali is this young Muslim scholar. He wants certainty. He grew up as a man of God. 
uh, as a man of God and uh, teaching people, calling them to God. And he spent his life knowing, thinking that his beliefs in God are certain truths, that God is one, that God exists and so forth, and that Muhammad is the prophet of God and so forth. And then he falls into the same skepticism as Al-Ghazali. He says, well, how do I know that's all true? How do I know that uh, this is foundational? How do I know that this is not just me following my parents? So then he says, okay, where do I obtain my knowledge from? I cannot obtain my knowledge from, I'm going to use this again, just because it's cool. I cannot obtain them from my sensory perceptions. They are deceitful. Why are they deceitful? Because the mind is limited and the and there are certain veils, right, that uh, 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 distort reality, fog and fog, uh, uh, eclipses, whatever it is, and so forth. So I will rely on foundational truths, truths that are a priori, al-ilm al-daruri. I cannot be sitting and standing at the same time. God cannot exist and not exist at the same time. One plus one equal to two. The triangle has three sides. Mumtaz. But Ghazali, again, being the brilliant man he is, like St. Augustine, says, no, no, no. I cannot stop here. Because what if, in the same way, foundational truths disprove sensory perceptions? What if there's something that is superior that also disproves our sensory perceptions, right? Again, keep in mind, Ghazali has an aim here, right? This is the key thing. This is the key thing to keep in mind, that he is not just asking these philosophical questions because he wants to write a paper for CVSP 205 and pass the course. Uh, he is asking these questions because at the end of the day, he is a man of God and he wants to know how can I with certainty know God? And the conclusion will be that I can only know God through the experience of God. This is yaqeen. I can read books, but I can also experience God. And that is what brings me certainty. So Ghazali begins his journey this 10-year journey, and he says, okay, well, let me look at what other people have said, right, about this superior cognitive faculty, whether or not it exists and so forth. So he begins with different methods. He says, okay, so there's different methods of knowledge. There are the mutakallimin, and then there are the bataniya, and there are the philosophers, and there are the mystics. Now, the mutakallimin are uh, scholars who dealt with what we call ilmul kalam, right? Dialectic uh, uh, the uh, theology, dialectic uh, theology. Um, um, whatever you want. I mean, there's different names for it. Uh, it's, 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 it's semantics. But basically, their goal was to provide rational evidences for the existence of God. Okay. Now, Ghazali had a very interesting uh, problem with them. He says, okay, I went and I studied with these guys. After I had done with theology, Ilm al-Kalam, I started on philosophy. I was convinced that, uh, one second. No, sorry, here it begins with philosophers. Let me go to the, what do you mean? One second. Okay, you know what? We are going to skip the mutakallimin. But I mean, let me just summarize basically what, what, because there's too many slides and this is the last lecture. Uh, 
basically the mutakallimin were interested in providing rational evidences. The problem with that is that they already had a starting point, right? They did not begin with the question, what is knowledge? They began with the, the, the premise, God exists. Now I must prove that God exists, right? So for Ghazali, he said, okay, that, that's, that's good. That's good. But you're kind of, you're, you're starting off with your conclusion. Uh, and then you had the botania. You don't really need to know who the botania are. Um, if you desire to know more about the botania and about the philosophers, I would be more than happy to record a full workshop for you guys on these three schools. So he goes through the Mutakalimin. One second. Clear all drawings. He goes through the Mutakalimin. He says, okay, these are cool, but this is not what I'm looking for. He goes to the Bataniya and he says, this is not what I'm looking for. He goes to the philosophers and he finds something quite profound, right? He finds different schools of thought, the Platonic, naturalist and so forth and um they expose they 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 have very interesting uh there, there's a diversity of, of philosophical schools and he deals with them and ghazali's engagement with the philosophers is in and of itself a course um which again i would be more than happy to explore inshallah uh if you were at your request but then he comes across the Sufis. Now, the Sufis, also known as mystics, claim that you can experience, you can know God with rational proofs. For example, everything which begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, God created the universe. Therefore, universe has a cause and it is God. That is a rational proof. The Sufis took a step further and said that rational evidence is a product of your reason. But you can also use your experience, your interiority to experience God. How do you do so? This is what the Ghazali will come to adopt. Let's see how. Mm -hmm. So Ghazali says, when I, when I had finished with these sciences, animal kalam, philosophy, and so forth, I turned to Sufism. And I knew, I discovered that Sufism was both the intellectual and the practical way of stripping myself of doubt. Now, it is intellectual in the sense that it is based on evidences and rational thinking, but it is also practical in two ways. And this is very important. It is practical in the sense that you can, your experience is something that is concrete, right? So you can have this concrete experience of God, of God's light, right? But it is also practical in that Sufism, like with St. Augustine, instructs you and tells you that reason is one thing, but to experience God, you must practically strip yourself of your desires, your vices, your carnal pleasures. For example, your desire for sex, your desire for gluttony, your desire for lust. So you must purify the interiority, right? You must purify the receptacle so that it can receive the experience of God. And so then he says, it became clear to me, however, that what is most distinct, distinctive of mysticism is something which cannot be apprehended by study, cannot be apprehended by, by books, right? For example, this is a book on God, on theology. Uh, something that cannot be apprehended by study, but only by immediate experience. So what is distinctive about 
uh, 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 Sufism is that it goes beyond the intellect and it allows you to taste a dhok, to experience God, right? And then he says, to, to sum it up, what a difference there is between knowing the definition of health and satiety, yani to quench your thirst, together with their causes and presuppositions and being healthy and satisfied. So he says, okay, I'm going to help you guys experience God as well. I'm going to take you through this journey. So first he introduces us to the concept of el niya, you're right? El niya, which is intentionality. No. Okay. What is intentionality? Intentionality basically means, for starters, in, in the basic day-to-day -day sense, that if I want to know something, I must have the, I must I must do so with a particular intention. If I want to travel south, I must turn southwards. If I want to turn to God. If I want to know God, this is what intentionality means. I must turn to God. I must have the proper intention, i.e. this is something which emanates from the heart. It does not emanate from the mind, right? So for example, if let's say we have two students in class and I tell you guys, go and learn about this dude named, uh, named Mike in uh, CVSP 202, right? So both of you, have the same intellectual tools, the same intellectual methods, right? But your intentions might be different. One of you, or one of your intentions might be, for example, okay, I'm just, I, I don't like this guy from the beginning. I'm going to go there. If I meet him, I'm just going to write a quick report about him, bring it back to uh, Ali and uh, get my grade. The other student might say, you know what? I want to get to know Mike. Right? I want to experience Mike. I want to be Mike's friend. So intentionality shapes the intentionality is essential in the process of experiencing and reaching God. So you cannot experience God if from the onset your intentionality is to negate his existence or to uh, or to merely theoretically know him for the sake of, of a paper or to prove that he does not exist, right? If you start off with that premise. Similarly, uh, uh, Ghazali says that the problem with the Mutakallameen was, was that uh, uh, you cannot begin with certainty that, that, that there is God, but you must have this openness to the possibility. Same thing with Augustine, this openness. To the possibility of God, and so, and and and, what is really intentionality? How do you actualize intentionality? In Niya, he says, in general, then how is the mystic way described? It is the purity, which is the first condition of it, right? In the same way, purity, bodily purity, is the first condition for prayer. The purity of the heart and of the self is the first condition for knowing God. So the first condition is the purification of the heart completely from what is other than God, the most high. The key to it, which corresponds to the opening act of adoration and prayer, is the sinking of the heart completely in the recollection of God and the end of it and the absorption in God. So it become it begins with this intentionality to reach openness to the possibility of God, a purification of the of the of the self to receive God, and then immersing and being completely absorbed in God. So what I've done here is I've uh, summarized a very long text and I have not done justice to it. And of course, there are gaps and there are questions and there are certain um, uh, uh, challenges that one can pose to Imam al-Ghazali, primarily in the way that the text is written. Although he says that I want to write 
in order to pursue certain knowledge. I do not want to begin with any presuppositions. It, the text comes off as that really God is the presupposition from the beginning and that the point is to reach God. Now, it is worth noting that he wrote this text for his students. Um, his students uh, as a beginner's text and it was kind of like an autobiography. But in other texts, such as Ahiyya Ulum al din and Tahafut al-Falasifa and, and other texts, he discusses these things in a bit more detail. Um, so think of this kind of as an abridgment. Think of this kind of as the confessions, as Ghazali uh, uh, jumping from one place to another in order to finally uh, be able to attain certainty, certainty of what? Certainty of God. In the same way, Augustine wanted certainty of God and he realized that that certainty can be obtained in two ways, through the Platonic method and through the experience of God. And in order to do so, you must purify yourself. You must purify the interiority. And that is 